live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering IFS World Conference 2019. Brought to you by IFS. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with my co-host, Paul Gillen. We're winding down day one of the IFS Conference, the World, Co World Conference here in, at the Heinz Auditorium in, in Boston. Paul Helms is here as the Senior Vice President of Customer Success at IFS, something that we've been talking about a lot, and Stefano Mattiello, who's the Senior Vice President and the Global Head of Consulting, also from IFS. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very Thank much. You. Hi Paul, let me start with you. So, kind of a loaded question. How do you define customer success? Well, it's a question I get very often, um, and customer success, you can make out of it what you want to. The way, the way IFS looks at it, it's not only me, but IFS looks at it is how do we take our involvement into our customers' business outcomes beyond the go live? Okay, so they buy software, they implement the software, they go live, and then what? Okay, so customer success is really looking into what is the quality of the relationship we have with our customers and how deep and how uh, integrated we are in that related to understanding what success means to our customers because it's it's different for every customer and then how do we back this up with the quality of service to really build that success and, and mine the value that is in the solution to the benefit of our customers so it's this long-term relationship driven by business outcomes that is customer success so historically in the software business you know uh, success was defined as you know we're live you know service now bakes right. a cake <laughs> yeah. Hey, success! Yeah. Um, that's not how you guys are defining. No, success. I mean it's, it goes way beyond the go live. In fact, I mean we, we're talking about success as actually starting even before the implementation even starts, right? Which is capturing what success means to that particular customer, right? In your business situation, what does success mean? Feed that in. We obviously want to get the customer live as quickly as possible. It's a time to value, right? And that talks to ROI. That's just the beginning of the, of the game. That's not the end of the game, right? So it's about what are we doing after the go-live phase? Um, what are the interventions that we're running in A, um, delivering on that promise that we made right up front that says, you know, what does success mean? Let's make sure we deliver on that. But then mo more importantly is how do we kind of maximize that success? You know, as, as the market dynamics are changing, as there's more pressure coming on your business, uh, your business is changing, right? So how do we evolve your business model? Because success today might have a particular shape and a particular color, but in nine months or 12 months time, it'll change, it'll mm -hmm. morph into something else. So it has a different definition. So it's about that lifelong engagement. You know, how do we keep redefining success? So at what stage does this uh, the success discussion begin? It's, it's very much, you know, as I said, in the, the early stages of what we would call the pre-sale cycle. So when we first start talking to a customer, is we really want to understand what are your business imperatives, right? Let's try to capture that. You know, it's, it's fundamental that we're not just selling technology for the sake of technology, but we're there to drive a business agenda. So it's it really, you know, as, as early as we can do it, I think that's that's where we can capture and, and maximize the, the delivery of that success. What does it really look like? So the sooner we do it, the better. That's and, and Paul, so looping that actually back into what do we see in our customers and, and the way they use the software and, and the way their business is changing and their environment is, and bringing this back all the way into the product, okay? And how do we shape the roadmap of the product using the insights into how customers are being successful using our products? Um, so, you know, we are not there yet, but that is the ultimate goal that we will build better products based on our customer success insights, and then turning this into a virtuous cycle to uh, to really drive and maximize customer value over their life cycle. So it goes beyond just the service, it, it, it really is all the way back into the product, how that adds value, how do we deliver this, and all the way back again. And I always argue, I mean, unless you're sort of a non-profit, or you know, if you're a hospital, you want to save lives, but if you're a for-profit company, you want to increase revenue, you want to cut costs, you want to drop you know, money to the bottom line, you want to rip the face off your competitors, mm -hmm. and you want to do some good for, mm -hmm. your, for your community. And so, I mean, you can take all these other factors, whether it's, you know, better customer satisfaction, better productivity, et cetera, and it usually boils down to, you know, those things. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, you know, those are your business imperatives. Yeah, that's what success looks like to you. But, but it's an iterative process, right? So, 
You know, so what I was saying earlier is it doesn't start and stop there. I mean, things will change. Um, and the approach we want to take is let's not just do it once, let's keep revisiting this, right? Because once you've captured those objectives and you're actually on top of those, or you think you're on top of those, then as we improve the product, as the market dynamics change, then you'll have different priorities, right? So let's keep revisiting. And, and the way we're looking at it is a project is no longer just a start and a stop, a uh, single time event, it's, it's an iterative process. Are you, yeah, are like you seeing awesome. priorities change, or maybe you don't have enough data to, to speak to this, but you know, we saw 160 CEOs recently signed a, uh, a petition or a proclamation, if you will, that it's not all just about shareholders, there are multiple, multiple stakeholders they have. Are you seeing uh, uh, priorities of customers change over time? I think when the conversations are changing, so when we talk about 10 years ago, probably talk about you know, optimization, it was purely you know, for getting more bang for your buck. Okay, so how do I take cost out? How do I become more efficient, more effective? The, the conversation is changing now to how do I become more sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, it's still, you still need to optimize, you still need to deliver better uh, and, and, and operate better, but it's not only for profit, it's also on how do I you know, become more sustainable, how do I leave you know, an environment for the youngsters in my company that they still have a company by the time that they are uh, you know, I mean, Benny at our been, age. Benny has been very outspoken about yes, that, he has. as you know. I'm just waiting for the day when the CEO misses three or four quarters in a row <laughs> and says, yeah, but you know, we're doing all this great tech for good. Uh, but, so, but I do agree, I mean, especially with millennials coming into the workforce, yeah. they want to see that their companies are doing good, they're giving back to the community and, and paying it forward. Uh, question on swim lanes, you got, I think, 400 partners um, what are the swim lanes between the services that you provide and your partners provide, and what's the overlap there? So, so this is the, the, the transition that we're in at the moment, is that you know, historically IFS was trying to be an all things to all customers, right? So we'll do everything from A to Z. Uh, what we're doing now is we're saying, well, let us focus on what we do best, which is our product, right? That's really what we do best. So what we want to do is we want to try and help the ecosystem, we want to help our partners in driving those efficiencies and actually implement as quickly as possible and drive value for our customers. So what we're doing is we're now moving into a position where we say, let us rather drive a value assurance discussion with our customers, let's safeguard projects. So we're working in a symbiotic relationship with partners, we're not competing with them, mm -hmm. right? So we know what we do, we know what they do. So you have some new services, IFS Selects, Select, IFS Success, um, IFS Tools and Methodologies. So, there's knowledge transfer then between yep. you guys and your partners, is that yep. right? How does that work? I mean, this takes investment. It's, you know, it's got to be more than just a press release, obviously. Yeah, yeah. We, we want our partners to know everything that we know. And, we, and yeah. we're, we're a software company, we're not a services company, and we don't want to compete in the services space. We want to use services to enable software, okay? and more software. Um, because the faster we grow our software business, the better for us as a company, because that is our core, core business. So, there's no competition with partners. We want to share what we know. We, want, we put it in tools and methodologies. We standardize knowledge. We share knowledge. We bring this out. We enable them in the same, we, we put our partners through the same training we put our own people. There's no you know, secret little room back there where we give them the real stuff, <laughs> you know, our own people. Um, so we are very open with, with knowledge and experience and, and sharing them uh, and helping them enabling this. So we will work with a partner to say, Okay, the first ones that you do, you might not be that confident, so let's you know, be there in a more intense way. And as you go along and you build your confidence and you build your competence, we can take a step back. Um, and, and therefore, we can still ensure quality for our customers while scaling through the ecosystem. So this is, you know, it, it sounds strange, but we really want, do not want to do the services business. We want to do the services business that we have to do, not as much as we can do. And I mean, just picking up on that as well, it's, it's, it's not only about enablement, we're actually actively sharing our tools and methodologies with our partners. So whatever we use ourselves, we're making available to our partners. And that's fundamental, right? That's yep. exactly what Paul says, is we want the partners to do exactly what we're doing, to the same level of quality, and, same standard. And we have a stated vision that says that the customer experience should not differ whether they use IFS as their partner or they use a service provider as a partner in their journey. It, 
because it's about the experience around the product, mm -hmm. not around the service. That should make the difference for them. And I think you have a dog fooding uh, booth here. I call it dog fooding. I know it's kind of a pejorative, but you know, your champagne, drink your own champagne. But, but you know, IFS runs I IFS. Yes. It's sort mm -hmm. of a, yeah. a big, a big theme right, here. Right so you guys us. have have you know implemented, and this is what you're talking about: the tools yeah. and methodology you use for your own business. Yep. Yeah. What have you seen in your own business? What kind of business impact have, has IFS had on your business? <laughs> it's um. So so we implemented our own. As you say, we drank our own champagne within six months. Uh, we came from an environment which was quite disparate, historically speaking, many different systems in different locations and, and regions, and we brought this and consolidated this into a global template. Um, this was hard, harder than we probably thought it was going to be, not technology-wise. Technology-wise, it was, yeah. yeah, technology is what technology is. But from a change management point of view, and from a you know, impact to the business and to, to people's daily operations, um, it was bigger than we thought. But when we so so that's a learning. We've captured this and our lessons learned. We have made some changes and brought in some new tools and methodologies and insights that we will share with our partners. Um, but if you now look at after uh, afterwards, we live the impact it has on our business. It's transformational. It is giving us insights which we never had before, giving the efficiencies which we never had before. It opens up new things that we consider as doing as a business and operating as a, as a business which we never had before. So, yes, was it was it hot? Yeah, it was hot. That's that's not. You know, what, what were you transitioning from? All sorts. <laughs> oh, so, so we, we, we had a... One of everything? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we literally had a cluster of uh, independent systems that all be modified, and I think this, this is another point, is that, you know, the historical approach to a lot of ERP installations is, um, tell me what you want and I'll develop it for you, right? And even, snowflakes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and even if it means that we're actually going to build a square wheel, which is not, the, <laughs> you know, not the best model, but that's what you want, yeah. so we're going to give you that. Whereas the approach we're taking now is, you know what, we've got enough capability and standard functionality from all of the years of experience that we have, go with, with kind of best, you know, best in breed approach. It's, it's more than enough than what you need and it'll give you that ability to switch it on and go live and, and run with it immediately rather than customizing it and spending three years and trying to get that square wheel which is actually not what you really need. Right. That right. seems to be the karma at the company. We've been hearing that all day about the value of not customizing. Yeah. Correct, exactly. And the, 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 the product itself and, the, and, the, and our solutions are, are very rich. And um, we, we take this one step further and say, well actually, how can we get our customers to adopt quicker depending on the industry that they are in? Because we have to accept that the way you do a certain thing in one industry is not exactly the same as its best practice in another industry for very good reason. So there's differentiation on how processes live in, in different industries. So Stefano and team has been very busy building what we call the accelerators, um, and how do we bring those industry best practices together in two things. One is as a quick start, so you know, here it is, just use it and run with it, and, and you're up and running very, in a very quick way. So that's our knowledge and experience that we share, and we make it available to, uh, through our partners as well. And secondly, it will allow us to keep that up to date as sort of the reference architecture for your industry to, as you go forward, you might, you know, be going one way with your uh, implementation. We say this is this is industry best practice, and how do you derive value between the gap uh, by adopting the gap between what is standard best practice and what you have in your solution? So driving that value over the life cycle as part of the success engagement. So you guys are senior executives um, at a global company. You talk to a lot of customers, and I, so I wonder if I could get your take on sort of the macro from a spending standpoint. I mean, we see in the U.S. You know, we're in the tenth year of a a boom cycle. Um, the IPO market here is kind of, you know, the window's closed, yeah. I think, at least at least for now, and, and the, the street, Wall Street's rewarding growth. I mean, they, don't, they don't care if you make profits. You know, things like cash flow, EBITDA, they don't, <laughs> they don't seem to matter. Um, and so, that's been going on now for the better part of a decade. Um, when you look at Europe, it looks like it's softening, you know, it's kind of overbanked, financial services, and now you're not exposed in financial services, certainly not in a big way. Um, but so what are you seeing across the globe just in terms of, of, of spending on, on tech, and what does it mean for your business? I mean, you're a share gainer, you're taking share, so you should mm -hmm. be somewhat insulated. 
uh, from any kind of you know, flattening or softening, e even though the softening is not precipitous. But I'm just wondering if you guys could give us your kind of uh, uh, anecdotal take on what's going on in the marketplace. You want to start? Okay. So I think two things that we, we see happening. We see many more new customers coming on uh, with us, so you saw this morning as well in the, in the, in the keynote, more than 50% of our revenue comes from net new customers to IFS. Yeah? That is amazing. There's, there's not another similar company that, that can claim that. We're outgrowing the market by more than three times the average. Okay? So, but that's one part of the story. The install base is the other part of the story. So the install base, what we see there is that they are spending on the digital transformation, on getting ahead in their game um, by, you know, tech is disrupting a lot of industries um, and it's enabling a lot of disruptors to enter markets that previously, and, and industries that previously were close to them. And financial services, you see that a lot, but also in the other industries, we, we see these young and upcoming uh, disruptors coming. So we see a lot of people and, and companies investing into the digital transformation, opening up new channels, opening up new markets that were not there before, but now with, with tech and the tech that is available is there. Um, at the same time, they need to create space and, and investment. You know, nobody has unlimited resources, so they're looking at optimizing what they have so that they can free up some cash and capital to invest into the, some of these disruptive uh, things. So it's, it's really an exciting time to be part of the industry and really exciting time to be part of a, a challenging and a challenger company like IFS that, that really goes out and, and focuses on its industries, focuses on its tech stack uh, where it matters. We're not trying to be everything to all men all of the time. We're really going after what we know we are good at. And you know, I think uh, the numbers show, show for themselves. So that half, half of the transactions are new adoption of yeah. IFS. Yes. Right. That's enormous. Half of the license revenue. That's from a yeah. license. Right, revenue. okay, yeah, but so, and then, I mean, unless, unless there's a huge proportion leaving your install base, which it doesn't sound like that's no. happening. No, it's not um, that, that if people are just even spending you know, flat with you guys, it's, it's a growth story. Yeah, it's, it's very, I mean, my opinion is it's all about choice. Customers want choice. They want, they want an alternative, right? Um, and I think what I think we're doing right, uh, well, at least what I like to think we're doing right, is that we focused on business outcomes. That's really what it's about. Yeah. You know, we're talking their language, uh, talking to their agenda, and we're giving them an alternative. And we're not forcing them to go into the cloud. We give them the option to go into mm -hmm. the cloud if they want to, but they can also stay on premise. We don't force them to go subscription model. The option is there, but they can also you know, choose for perpetual. If, uh, if it's. So it's, it's really about giving them choice, talking to the customer business outcomes, and engaging in a, in a really customer-centric and customer-intimate way along that journey, um, and it's working. So given the, the success you're having, in, in, in specifically in Europe, do you see, how, how, what do you feel, how do you feel about your ability to export that success to North America? Well, we're doing that already. I mean, it's happening, and you know, we're seeing growth globally, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, uh, yes, I mean, in certain regions it's, it's accentuated and, and larger, but it definitely is, it's a global phenomenon. We are seeing that. Um, and I think a lot of it is also uh, coming back to our focus, right? Uh, I think you made the point that it's not, we're not trying to be all things to all people. Mm. Where we focus, that's where we really excel. So t the kind of the answer to your question is less about the geographies and more about the industries that we want to focus mm -hmm. on, regardless of where they are. Right. That, that's the approach we're taking. And also right. the capabilities we bring. You know, field service management has been a, you know, a very healthy growth area for us. We saw this morning again, you know, we just announced the acquisition of Fastia. Uh, that will further enhance our capabilities in this place. They, they're really a leader in, in, in what they're doing. So that, that level of focus makes us win in our, in our industry. I mean, that looks like a good acquisition. That's a, that's a lever, a relatively small company, but, and you, you picked it up, from what I can tell, pretty, pretty cheaply, but, it, but the impact of your business is significant. Yep. So that's good, congratulations. All right, Chance, I know we're probably cool. keeping you from important <laughs> customer dinners and, uh, and touring Boston, so thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It was great to have you. Really thank you. It. Thank you very much for thanks. having us. All right, thank you for watching, Paul. It's great working with you. As and that's a wrap do. here from IFS World in Boston. And uh, this is theCUBE. Go to siliconangle.com for all the news. Go to theCUBE.net for, for all these videos, and we'll see you next time.